Madison Church, and it is, I always count it as such a blessing to get to be here together with you guys on Sunday morning to worship our Lord. I want to read you a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What a strange thing that a mode of execution that was meant for ignominy and shame uh, becomes the power of God, according to the gospel. Let's stand together and worship our Savior who went to the cross for us this morning.
morning uh, for prayer time uh, we have a lot to pray about again this week uh, I'd like to do some updates first if I may uh, Margaret Dyer she is out of ICU this week and from the last I heard she's doing well so there's a, a Thanksgiving and a blessing and uh, also I'd like to pray for Marcia Hash this morning uh, she's going to have some surgery done this Tuesday so be with her this day and this week as well uh, Rachel Taylor, Marjorie DeVilder's daughter, uh, is out in the state of Washington. So uh, please pray for her, for the doctors can find out what's going on, and for her family back here. So I just pray for them all. Uh, also, uh, DJ Kaylee, and I believe I pronounced that right, uh, Stephanie Shepard's nephew, uh, died suddenly this week. So uh, please be with that entire family as they uh, suffer his loss. Uh, also, I was given a prayer request here this morning. Uh, Laverne and Colleen Litka's friend and neighbor, Vivian Plate, and some of you may know her, you may not, from Grinnell. Uh, she had a very severe stroke this week. Uh, both legs and right arm are paralyzed, and then she's unable to talk or swallow. So she has a very, very long road to recovery. So please be with her as well. Uh, I believe that's all the updates I have anyway. <clears throat> uh, to begin our prayer time together, uh, I'm kind of amazed at the many times in our Bible reading from the last two or three years, Jesus would always step away from the crowd. And uh, just so he'd be alone, uh, the, all the people around him, he would just step away to be quiet, to be with his father in complete silence. He would pray for himself as well as others for strength and endurance in all his situations. And he also prayed for guidance and direction. It's a lot like our prayer time, I think, should be. Uh, our week is, prayer time is similar to his with our busyness. 
of our everyday life, we need time to focus on our prayer time. And sometimes we just can't find the time as one answer people give with just as little commotion and just the pure quietness of a church. So at this time, uh, I'd like to go to prayer time together. Uh, pray, we need to pray for guidance to those who need healing and direction for both minds, body, and spirit. So please bow with me in prayer at this time. Lord, we love you as our Savior and as someone who can, we can put our faith in as we speak out to you in prayer. We continually pray for our country and its leaders, for guidance and directions, for a more unified and peace, that, the peace unified and peace-seeking country that we are. <clears throat> We pray for our community, that as a church, we be a light that shines bright for those that are in darkness and don't know where to turn. We pray for each other. We pray a special blessing upon DJ Colley and his sudden death. We also pray for Marsha Hash this coming week for her surgery, for healing of their bodies and minds, both young and the old, for we put our trust in you. We say a prayer for our church family members. We pray for Rachel Taylor, May the doctors find out what's going on and may you give her complete healing and peace of her mind. We also pray for Margaret Dyer. We thank you for the healing that was done and the healing that will come. She's going to be 99, Lord, and she's lived a long life. So we pray for her continued healing. We also say a prayer for our church family members who are confined to their place of residence. May you give them peace, joy, and pure, pure happiness through your words of encouragement. With our commitment to being a shining light for you, we look forward to your return to take us home with you to heaven someday. We ask all of these prayer requests in your son Jesus, who gave up his life on the cross for us. In his name we pray. Amen.
The scripture I'm going to use this morning uh, for communion is 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 24, and 25. It's uh, scripture we don't use that often, but I'd like to read it. And Paul is putting in his letter to the church at Corinth. He writes this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is now is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And then in verse 28, Paul urges us to examine ourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup so that we approach communion in the proper manner. As I got this ready this week, I kind of, for some, some reason, puzzles came to my mind. And I thought about the wire puzzles you, I had when I was a kid. And they're the kind of things that mom and dad took to church for me to try to put together and take back apart so I'd be quiet. And, oh, okay, right. I'll see if I can find one for Forrest. We, and they, and, and I don't know, I'm sure they're still around, but they were very difficult once they got together, take them back apart. And after a while, I worked on, worked on every day. And after a while, I could almost do that puzzle without the eye contact, with only the hand contact. And I got to thinking, you know, the Bible's kind of the same way. You know, Joel mentioned this morning about the cross, the crucifixion, and how you compare that to life everlasting. And I, I thought to myself, um, as I studied this, unless you know about the church in Corinth, and unless you know what Paul was dealing with, it doesn't mean quite the same, but this was a church in a Roman capital of Greece. And it was a, a military outpost. It was valuable for commerce and militarily both because of the bays on each side of this isma. And I thought to myself, the church in Corinth had been established by Paul in his second missionary journey and he'd spent 18 months there and and when he left he went to Ephesus and left it in pretty good standing but the church started falling apart and there were problems within the church and to really shorten this meditation I'm going to say what happened were there were wealthy people within the church that weren't taking care of those that didn't have the resources they did and the communion was a dinner. And that's why it says here, after supper, I took the cup and do this in, remember me, in remembrance of me. Because what happened with wealthy people or those people that had came in, ate all the food, and there wasn't anything left for this communion celebration with those that were in need. And so often when we read through the Bible, we start to understand that there are so many different verses here and there. You got Matthew, Mark, and Luke that kind of repeat themselves. And here you have Corinthians, and you can't really understand Corinthians unless you read about Paul that's in Acts, the way Luke describes the life of Paul, and you start to fit, fit in it all together. All at once, that puzzle comes apart pretty easily. And my point is that you can't get that puzzle and take it apart or put it together the way it should be unless you, you, have, you work at it daily. Now, we have Bible reading in church every week. And Joel's left um, out in the foyer's um, background on those scriptures that we're going to read, and I encourage you to take them and look at them. And it helps you study as you work through that. But the most important thing is is a puzzle itself. We know about the death and resurrection, and we work at putting those puzzles in the puzzle every day through life. That comes from studying the scripture, understanding the scripture. 
And I'm confident that the last piece of that puzzle that makes the puzzle perfect is the return of Jesus Christ. So as we go to communion today, just as Paul told the church in Corinth that had divisions, legalism had snuck into the church, they were having other problems, and, and Paul made it very clear to them that love was the most important thing and to know Jesus Christ, the rest of the problems would fall to the side. So today during communion, let's thank God that he has given us this opportunity to meet as a group, to understand Jesus shed blood, what it meant, that broken body as he broke the bread, the shed blood as we take that cup, we understand that Jesus' death and resurrection was for each one of us as sinners. Lord, thank you for the examples you've given us throughout the scripture. I'd ask that you be with each one of us. I know you hear our prayers. Help us to understand that going to you in prayer, especially during this time of communion, is so important that we know and love you as our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you that uh, you let us be a part of spreading the gospel around the world. Uh, thank you for uh, that we can uh, bless people in our own community and that we can bless those around the world. And uh, we just thank you for that opportunity. In Jesus' name. There's some announcements in your bulletin that I'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, this Today, uh, we're doing the Brookhaven, Brookhaven service at 1.30. And you can always join us for that. Uh, it's a fun time getting to worship together with the nursing home residents there in the community room. That's today at 1.30. Uh, this week, the Brooklyn Fire Department is having their fish fry on Friday. And that'll be for uh, lunch and supper. And so if you're interested in attending that to support the fire department, that's this Friday. Next Sunday, uh, there's going to be a potluck here at the church. And so I, I really invite you to join us for that. Potlucks are, are so fantastic. The food here is wonderful. We have wonderful people that prepare wonderful food. And we would love for you to plan on joining us for the potluck next Sunday. That'll be just downstairs right after church. And then I just wanted to show you, maybe you haven't noticed, but there is some new stuff up here. We have a new screen and a new projector, and, and what you can see that's different up front is only about half of the changes that we made uh, over the last two weeks. A lot of them are, are back in the balcony uh, with our video system back there, and quite a bit of it has changed. First of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who helped with that, who put in time helping us take down the old stuff and put up the new stuff. And I wanted to let you know about a special person we had helping us. Matt Smith um, came up and helped us on Friday. He's Dennis Smith's son. Dennis Smith was a pastor here for over 30 years. Uh, Matt's still connected to Madison Church. Sometimes he'll tune in and, uh, and join us on, uh, join our Sunday service online. And, um, and he comes up and helps every once in a while. He's a technical expert. And so he can help me do a lot of things that I don't know how to do with the projectors and cabling. And Matt Smith put in a lot of work helping us. Uh, so if you uh, see Matt ever or run into him, or just even if you don't, just know that he, he really helped us out with this. Craig mentioned the Bible, uh, Bible reading plan study notes that are out there in the foyer. We're doing a Bible reading plan this year together as a church through the Old Testament prophets. And in the New Testament, we're reading all the, all the books of John together through the year. We would love for you to join us in doing that. It works out to, to just over a chapter a day. It's really not a demanding reading plan. If you just sat down for one, one 30-minute reading session each week, you can get that done. Uh, in case you want to know more about the, what we're reading, or maybe just 30 minutes of reading a week isn't enough for you, you want to dig a little deeper into the text, we're making study notes. Uh, as a church, we put them out online on our Facebook page, and also I print out some copies out here in case you can't get them online. I think it's probably a little better to look at them on your phone or computer because a lot of times in the study notes there'll be a link to an article in there that you could click on and read even more. Well, you can't do that on a piece of paper <laughs> yet. We haven't discovered how to do that. Um, so just know that, that they're out there in the foyer. They're also available online. Uh, every week they get posted on our Facebook page on Sunday afternoon or you can go to our website you, like you go to our website right now and find this week's uh, study notes out there on the homepage. So that's the place where you can look for them. We've been reading through the book of Isaiah together. We've been doing that for three weeks, and we're not even a third done yet with reading through Isaiah. Isaiah is a long book. Our reading plan this year is divided up into word count, so the number of words you read each week is roughly the same. And there's just a whole lot of Isaiah. And uh, reading through it can be a bit of a slog. I don't know if you feel that way. I do, and I'm a preacher, so it's okay. It's fair for you to think that. Everybody always thinks uh, that, that Bible reading plans get difficult at Exodus and Leviticus. And, and I don't. I think those books are pretty fascinating. But when I get to the major prophets and I go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, that's when it gets, that's when it gets hard, and particularly because it's not very encouraging subject matter. All these people are in trouble with God. Uh, and and the God's people in the Old Testament have gotten on his bad side, and, and they're in trouble. And, and that is what the prophets have to say over and over. And so you get this cycle of God condemning and, 
and promising judgment for their iniquities, and also at the same time holding out hope and promise of restoration after, after they've received their punishment. And it's, it's kind of an, a repeating cycle over and over through the major prophets. And so we get this repetitive loop of condemnation and future hope of redemption. And they're being condemned because, because it's being written to people on God's bad side. That's something we've been talking to, about together as a church here, is the dynamic of, of what it means to be a believer and be on God's bad side, to be disciplined by God for your sin, uh, to be, uh, to upset God with the way that we're living, even though we belong to his covenant people. We've been talking about what it's like to be there, and it, we're going to start to talk about how to get out, um, and we've been talking the, about this from the perspective of God's people, uh, but we're going to shift a little bit today. We're going to look from the perspective of, of being outside God's people. Uh, we talked about how God, people get on God's bad side and receive a discipline because God loves them. Right? The same way that a father will punish their son, it's not because he doesn't like his son. A father punishes his son because he loves his son and wants what is best for him. He wants, he wants him to, to know what is right to do in the future and to not do what is wrong. So he'll punish him for doing wrong. And through Isaiah, God tells his people that he has brought them hardship after hardship after hardship so they would change their ways. We read a passage last week where God said four times, look what I did to you, but still my hand is upraised and I am set against you. We've been talking about this dynamic in the life of a believer that God disciplines the children he loves, and that we should consider our ways when we suffer and count it as an opportunity to wake up to our sin and repent of it. Right? So when we're suffering and when we're experiencing God's discipline, we need to be aware of the fact that we could be on God's bad side. We need to be sensitive to the idea that we may, uh, we may be upsetting God by our sin and receiving discipline from him. But there's an important caveat I need to add to that. Not all suffering is God's discipline. Okay? Just because something goes wrong or something terrible happens in our life, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are being disciplined by God. God's Word makes clear that much of what we suffer in our lives comes from the brokenness of our fallen world, especially the brokenness of the fallen people in our fallen world is often what brings pain and difficulty to our lives. Thus, you can't see every hardship or struggle that you face as God's discipline. You'd make yourself go crazy uh, doing that. If, if you wonder every time something goes wrong, wondering, oh, what did I do wrong to make God give me this hardship? That would, that would be uh, a dizzying perspective on life. Often when something bad happens or you're really struggling and you ask the question, what, did I, what do I need to do, God? What do you want from me? The answer will be nothing. You're suffering the product of a sin. Uh, your suffering was the product of a sin you committed, but the larger sin, the problem of the entire world and the people who inhabit it. Okay? So it's not necessarily something you did wrong, but, but just the fact that the world is wrong. But as we've seen in Isaiah thus far, sometimes it can be God's discipline. So what do you need to do? We need to constantly be examining our faithfulness to God so that we can know the difference. Just because not all suffering is from God's hand as discipline doesn't mean that we need to stop paying attention to whether or not we're being disciplined by God. If we examine our own faithfulness and establish a relationship with God, we can have an awareness of whether or not we're suffering because of the product of our evil world or evil people in our world or whether or not we're suffering discipline at God's hand. So if you will do the kinds of things you need to do to have this awareness, if you will read God's word, if you will have a relationship with God in prayer, if you will fellowship with his body, the church, those are all things that can give you an awareness, a perspective to be able to know or have an idea of whether or not you're being disciplined by God or whether or not you're just suffering evil because evil is here and has not yet been finally defeated. When we're doing these things, we can treat each hardship as an opportunity to grow 
and may even be able to distinguish when we're being disciplined by God for our, our own unfaithfulness. So not all suffering is God's discipline. Now today as we open to Isaiah chapter 14, we're going to look at the corresponding opposite of that truth. It is true that when you suffer, it is not necessarily God's discipline. On the opposite side of that, it is also true that when you have success and when life is going good, that is not always God's blessing. When things go right in your life, when things feel good, that does not necessarily mean that God is pleased with what you're doing. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 14 this morning, and Isaiah is mostly about Judah and Israel, but if you're following along with our Bible reading plan, you'll know that this week we started a section of Isaiah that is about other nations, the neighbors around Israel, and God uses Isaiah to speak prophecies about concerning them, mostly prophecies of judgment towards them. So all of a sudden, we're not talking about God's people. We're talking about other nations like, uh, like Cush and like uh, Aram. And, and, to, and in this passage that we're going to read in Isaiah 14, it is about Babylon. And that is kind of a, a tricky thing that God's Word talks so much about Babylon in Isaiah because Babylon is not really a big deal in Isaiah's time. Babylon is a, is a very minor deal in Isaiah's time. Most of what Isaiah is about is about the pressing invasion from the Assyrian Empire. And if you thought for a second that I was going to christen a new projector this Sunday without a map on the screen, you are sorely mistaken. And so here we go. We've got we to gotta put some maps up. Oh, actually, uh, we have to read Isaiah 14, 1 through 3 first. I was so excited for the map that I jumped the gun. So... Isaiah 14 doesn't start out about Babylon. It starts out about Judah and Israel. That's where we get this transition. So at the beginning of Isaiah 14, this is what we read. The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Okay, so he's promising restoration after their punishment. Foreigners will join them and unite with the descendants of Jacob. Nations will take them and bring them to their own place, and Israel will take possession of the nations and make them male and female servants in the Lord's land, and they will make captives of their captors and rule over their oppressors. On the day the Lord gives you relief from your suffering and turmoil, from the harsh labor forced on you, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon." There's the, there's the kingdom of Babylon that we're going to talk about here uh, in Isaiah chapter 14. And I just want to show you why that's a little bit strange and also give you some context for, for what these words in chapter 14 are going to be about. Okay? Uh, this is just a map of the uh, Mesopotamia in the time when Isaiah begins writing. Okay? So the Assyrian Empire is, uh, is the big bully uh, at the time when Isaiah starts writing. And you'll see the nation of Israel there in green uh, is, is still independent from the Assyrian Empire. It is not controlled by them. And, and so is Judah down there south of Israel. Um, but shortly, like while Isaiah is prophesying, the Assyrian Empire goes from this status to this. So they expand quite a bit. And they, they overtake and exile the nation of Israel. You'll notice back here, Israel there in green. That's the 10 northern tribes of God's kingdom. While Isaiah is prophesying, they are overrun by the Assyrian Empire, and they cease to exist. You'll notice Judah is there lightly shaded blue because uh, they are attacked by Assyria, but Hezekiah play, uh, sends them away. He pays a, a large tribute to them at first, and then God turns away the Assyrian Empire uh, when they're at the gates of, Jer of Jerusalem. And you'll also notice a tiny... Uh, little speck over here that is also light blue, uh, vassal kingdom of the Assyrian Empire of Babylon. Uh, as you can see, they're not a very big deal. <laughs> Judah isn't a very big deal. It's about four times the size of the independent state of Babylon at this time. And so God's word is going to speak this against Babylon, and it'd be a little confusing as to why God's word has anything to do with Babylon, who is a bit of a nothing at the time when Isaiah 14 is being written. But God knows what is going to transpire with the nation of Assyria and the nation of Babylon. And here in just a short time, 
after Isaiah is done prophesying, the Assyrian Empire becomes the Babylonian Empire. Uh, Babylon comes in and overtakes Assyria. Uh, they take a, a ton of the land. They, they even take Judah uh, in, in 586. Uh, they overtake Judah and they, they occupy all of Mesopotamia. This does not last very long for Babylon. Babylon is only in this position for maybe 60 or 70 years uh, because on their heels comes the Medo-Persian Empire the Achaemenid Empire here on the screen, but it's the, it's the Medo-Persians. Uh, king Cyrus in the Old Testament is a Persian king, and they, uh, they overtake this entire land. So, all this to explain about Babylon. Babylon uh, is going to go from a very small, insignificant uh, portion of the Assyrian Empire to being a great kingdom to dominating the entire Mesopotamian world. They're, they are going to do that after Isaiah is done speaking. And so God is going to give them a message. What do you think God will say to a nation that is about to overtake the entire Mesopotamian world? What do you think God has to say to a people who are about to experience the greatest wealth and success that they have ever had in their history as a people? What would God say to them before that happens? That's what we'll get to read in Isaiah chapter 14 as we pick back up here in the middle of verse 4. How the oppressor has come to an end. How his fury has ended. The Lord has broken the rod of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, which in anger struck down peoples with unceasing blows and in fury subdued nations with relentless aggression. All the lands are at rest and at peace. They break into singing. Even the junipers and the cedars of Lebanon gloat over you and say, now that you have been laid low, no one comes to cut us down. The realm of the dead below is all astir to meet you at your coming. It rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you. All those who are leaders in the world, it makes them rise from their thrones. All those who are kings over the nations, they will all respond. They will all say to you, you have become weak as we are. You have become like us. All your pomp has been brought down to the grave, along with the noise of your harps. Maggots are spread out beneath you, and worms cover you. This is what God says to the people who are about to, to take over the world, who are about to experience incredible success, incredible wealth, incredible prosperity, to achieve the desire of what they want so badly. God tells them about their destruction. God tells them that he is going to bring them low, that they will be welcomed to the realm of the dead by all the peoples that they had conquered, that maggots would spread out beneath them and worms would cover them. You see, the, the Lord is going to bring them to an end, and even before they rise to power, even before they take that step, God says, I am going to destroy you. We get to see a glimpse uh, in those words we just read about why God is going to do that, especially here in the beginning uh, of verse 11. That first line there gives us an idea of, of what kind of trouble Babylon is in, but it will become more clear as we read on, picking up in verse 12, still in Isaiah 14. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you as they ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a wilderness and overthrew its cities, and who would not let its captives go home. All the kings of the nations lie in state, each in his own tomb, but you are cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch. You are covered with the slain, those who were pierced by the sword, those who descended the stones of the pit like a corpse trampled underfoot. You will not join them in burial, for you have destroyed your land and killed your people. Let the offspring of the wicked never be mentioned again. 
Prepare a place to slaughter his children for the sins of their ancestors. They are not to rise to inherit the land and cover the earth with their cities. You see, this message to Babylon is given to them because of their pride. Even though Babylon is about to have incredible period of success, even though they are about to be very wealthy, even though they are about to achieve what every earthly kingdom wants, God says your pride will lead to your destruction. They ignored God. They ignored his righteousness. Many other places in the prophets in the Old Testament, you will see Babylon condemned for their wickedness. So they ignored God, they ignored being righteous, and those two things brought them incredible worldly success. When they were ignoring God and when they were ignoring righteousness, they gained incredible wealth. They were so successful. Everything was going right for them. But what will become of them after they've had all that success? That's what Isaiah 14 is about. They will be punished. They will suffer. They will be destroyed. Let me ask you this morning, what will become of you and I if we ignore God and pursue our own success? What will become of you and I if we forsake faithfulness for our own pursuits, our own importance, our own goals, our own pride. What will become of those who are prideful enough to feel comfortable on God's bad side? That's what the kingdom of Babylon is about to do. They're about to ignore God. They're about to ignore what God wants and what God tells them is right, what God tells them is wrong. And they're about to be okay with that. And they're going to experience incredible success, incredible wealth. They're going to feel great about it. But God is telling them that it will ultimately lead to their destruction. And they will suffer so much for having done it. Our fate will be the same as Babylon. If we ignore our faithfulness to God to pursue our own success to pursue our own goals, our own joy, our own wealth. It may very well give you what you want. You may get the wealth you're pursuing. You may achieve the goal you have in mind. You may experience the success that you've always wanted and and gain the respect of the people that you want to impress. But if you forsake God to do it, if you ignore Him, if you have the pride in your heart to not care what he thinks. It will lead to your destruction. And ultimately, you will experience the kind of fate that Babylon does. What will become of those people who are prideful enough to feel comfortable on God's bad side? Let's finish our passage now, picking up in verse 22. God says, I will rise up against them, declares the Lord Almighty. I will wipe out Babylon's name and survivors, her offspring and descendants, declares the Lord. I will turn her into a place for owls and into swampland. I will sweep her with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord Almighty. Remember last week we read about four times God warning the people of Israel that that he was trying to get their attention by bringing them suffering, by giving them discipline. Now, here about Babylon, we read this fourfold pronouncement about God saying what he is going to do. They ignored God. They were prideful in their hearts and wanted to take his place. So God says four times, he says, I, me, the one you're ignoring, am going to punish you. I'm going to tear you down. I'm going to turn the place uh, where you live into a swampland. When we read this passage about Babylon, this is a lesson for us. We cannot be comfortable on God's bad side. We cannot be counted among the people who ignore what God thinks to pursue our own success and our own desires, our own goals. It will lead to our destruction. 
We must pursue faithfulness. We must seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness before we pursue our own earthly success, our own fleshly goals. Don't let worldly success distract you from what is really important. Pleasing God is important. And the consequences of that decision that you make here on earth in the time that you are given before your death are, is going to have eternal consequences. Don't be prideful like Babylon, prideful enough to be comfortable on, bad, on God's bad side. Don't let success poison your heart to not caring about what God wants for you. When we experience success, when we uh, get what we want, when we get wealth, we need to humble ourselves. If we do not humble ourselves, we might fall like Babylon. There are some people in the New Testament who are blinded by their success. People who, who were so comfortable with how things were going in their life that they didn't care about what God thought of them. Is addressed in this letter that, that Christ is speaking to them, to the church in Laodicea in Revelation 3. Jesus says to them, You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. This is a people who, who thought they were fine and thought everything was great, especially because the things that they wanted on this earth, they were getting. Maybe they thought that they were experiencing God's blessing. Maybe they thought that God must be really encouraged by how they're behaving and, and so giving them the material comforts that they want. But that was not the case. They were prideful in their hearts. Prideful enough to not care whether or not God was displeased with them. We have to humble ourselves. Especially when we experience success. Especially when things are going well. We need to remember that we have to pursue faithfulness to God or else the success that we're experiencing temporarily will one day be destruction. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I ask that you will correct the direction of our eyes and the posture of our hearts. God, forgive us for the times when we are prideful enough in ourselves to not care about what you think about what we're doing. God, give us a conviction to be obedient to you, to be faithful to your word and to the gospel so that we won't waste our lives earning our own destruction. Dear Heavenly Father, purify us from that which puts us on your bad side. Make us faithful followers who can truly experience your blessing and will one day be called by your name. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand as we close today? You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God
Sunday. We'll see you next week.